Hey guys, welcome to Population Ecology Part 1. So we're going to talk about populations today. And as you can see, when we break down ecology, uh, we can look at the organism, which is looking at uh, just the lifestyles of a particular species, uh, when it mates and who it mates with, and uh, what types of environment it lives in and things of that nature. But populations is a different, that's a group of different a group of different individuals of the same species. Community is going to be different populations interacting with each other, such as predator and prey. And of course, the ecosystem is looking at these communities and energy flow and uh, matter cycling in them. So I hope you got your notes. And uh, you should have your population ecology part one notes. And away we go. All right. So here is a population of monarch butterflies, and if you do not know this, monarch butterflies migrate about 5,000 miles from parts of the northeast of uh, our country, like New England, New York, and things of that nature. They pass down through Alabama on their way to the mountains of Mexico. So if I wanted to study the population ecology of, of monarch butterflies, I'm going to have to know a lot of information about them. And we're going to look at what some of those things are that we need to know. All right, first of all, life takes place in populations. And as I said earlier, a population is a group of individuals of the same species in the same area at the same time. All of these individuals rely on the same resources. All of these individuals may react with one another, and they all have the potential to interbreed. Okay, so um, we now we can have separate populations of the same species. Uh, just think of uh, fish in a lake, like bass. Over in, um, in Lake Martin, we have bass populations. In Lake Smith, we have bass populations. Uh, those two populations are never going to come together because they live in different river systems unless somebody physically grabs some bass and brought them over and dumped them from one lake into the other, there's no way their genes are going to mix. So they are separate populations, okay? Because they don't interbreed, um, but they are the same species. So when we think about population ecology, what a population ecologist is really focusing on are what other factors that affect a particular population. Can you think of some factors that affect a population? I want you to write a few down. So, maybe some of the factors you wrote down are going to match these that are, are right here. Okay, so let's look at what they possibly are. One, there are abiotic factors. We have the amount of sunlight, we have the, uh, which gives rise to the temperature. We can look at the amount of rainfall in the form of precipitation. It could, that could come as snow also. And we look at the soil and nutrients available to them. Those are all abiotic factors that affect the distribution of populations. It's the reason why we have tropical species and desert species and savanna species and so on and so on. There are, of course, biotic factors that affect populations, other living organisms. Abiotic is non-living, biotic is living. And again, what are some of those living organisms? Those could be the type of organisms that the uh, one population eats. Okay, so the prey items. It could be other competitors uh, that are competing for a similar resource. Down in this bottom picture, you see a lion that's just killed a zebra. But we also see a hyena in the background and vultures also trying to eat on this zebra. Now, other things that you may not think about, but that are also that they can also affect population distributions are things like parasites and disease. Of course, and there are these things we call intrinsic factors. These are things that uh, the that are part of the organism's genetics. Okay, and that might be at the age of when it first breeds. Can you think of some other things? That might be intrinsic factors that are part of your genes that might affect where or uh, uh, how far you can live in terms of different types of habitats. <clears throat> so when we have to characterize a population, i.e. describe it, we will look at a couple of different things. We'll look at its range. Where do we see it? 
Okay, if you look in this popular this uh, picture on the upper right hand corner, it's showing a cattle egret, and it's showing that cattle egrets first arrived in South America in 1937. These are African species, and we can now find cattle egrets in Alabama. Okay, they got over to South America somehow. We don't know. They got on. They uh, got blown over by a storm. Maybe they hitchhiked a ride on some boats and things. But they got over there from Africa, and they have been expanding their population northwards ever since. Now these are African birds. What might, what might, what do you think might limit their spread northwards? Okay. Other factors that we can look at with populations is their density. If we look at the picture of the penguins, we can see that these penguins are packed pretty tightly on the breeding grounds. Um, whereas we look at these zebra here uh, in the Serengeti, they have they are not so dense. There's a lot of animals there, but they're constantly moving around. Okay, so again, population range and the pattern of spacing. Okay, and that's leading to their density. How many individuals are there per unit area? That's what the word density means: the number of individuals per unit area. Okay. And we have to look at the size of the population. Some populations are small, some are very large. And some of this is due to some of those intrinsic factors uh, that we talked about, that I mentioned earlier. We'll go into those a little bit further shortly. Okay, so population range um, is oftentimes many species are limited by, like I said, the abiotic and biotic factors. One of those, of course, being temperature and rainfall. Okay, or as you can see, uh, polar bears have adaptations to polar biomes. They have lots of fat. They have, have hollow hairs to keep them warm. They're voracious predators. And the scarlet macaws on the right-hand side have adaptations for living in a tropical system. They cannot stand cold weather. Okay. Many populations, unfortunately, around the world are what we considered endangered species, and most endangered species have relatively small distributions. They're not very common. They are limited to a very small area, and because of that, they are um, uh, more susceptible to changes to their environment, which, because they're a small population, those changes can wipe them out. Um, and of course, some of these species are endangered because of us. Uh, we have changed the habitat. We hunt them. We uh, value them for other things besides them living in the wild, such as the white rhinoceros, which is valued for its horn. And they are almost completely extinct in the wild. So let's look at population spacing. How do we often find animals dispersed, or plants, it doesn't have to be animals, both plants and animals dispersed in the environment? And there are three basic patterns, clumped, random, and uniform. And again, when we look at how these organisms are spaced, uh, it does provide some insight into maybe environmental conditions. What might you think would cause clumping? Uh, think about that for a little bit. And um, what might cause uniformity at, uh, what might cause populations, or I should say individuals within a population to be spaced uniformly from each other? Think about that for a second. Now, I also want you to answer the question, which spacing pattern do you believe is most common? And if you said clumped, you are correct. Okay, and you might go, clumped, why are they clumped? Well, clumped spacing patterns are a result of the une uneven distribution of resources. Resources are not, rand are not randomly dispersed through the, uh, the environment. Water is only found where there's water, so many species are found, can be found near the water. And um, some species are, especially plants, are adapted to very specific types of soils, and the soils are not evenly distributed throughout the environment either. Some, plant, some organisms are found where there's plenty of light, such as in the top layers of the water, and others are found where there's very little light, down, such as in the very deep bottoms of the ocean. 
Also, clumping helps to protect um, uh, individuals from predation. There's more eyes looking for predators. They can detect those, uh, those predators much more rapidly and be more secure while they are out foraging for food. Uniform is a result of generally territoriality in animals. Uh, they are trying to keep them, uh, keep other uh, birds away from their nest sites. This is very common. Or like with lions and wolves and things like that, they require uh, large territories in order to uh, protect their food resources. Hummingbirds are very territorial around their food resources, such as flowers, and if you go into a hummingbird's territory, if you are wearing red, you will oftentimes be buzzed or attacked by those hummingbirds. Now, plants also can somewhat be uniformly dispersed, but it's not due to territoriality. It's due to resource needs, especially in ecosystems that are um, more like desert ecosystems. So what do you think is the limiting factor that's causing plants to be dispersed uniformly, uh, uniformly in a desert ecosystem? What are they competing for? Excuse me. Once again, when we characterize the populations, we have to look at the range, the spacing, and the initial size of the population. So let's look at that size of the population. What's affecting the size of a population? Well. Populations are going to grow through the process of births and immigration. Those are going to increase the population size. Populations are going to shrink due to death and emigration. So like here in the United States, my parents were immigrants to the United States because they came from, my mom came from Sweden, my father came from Denmark, okay? But my brother is an immigrant from the United States. He moved to Canada and left the United States. So he's an immigrant. My parents were immigrants. So I'm sure you can think of other examples of that. Um, again, birth and immigration increase population size, death and emigration decrease population size. And in our next lecture, we're going to look at how we can apply mathematics to model growing populations. Okay. Now, something else also can affect a, a, pop, a, a population, and, and that is uh, an organism's survivorship curve. So let's look at this graph. We see survival per thousand on the y-axis, and we see percent of maximum lifespan on the x-axis. And so, as the box says, what do these graphs tell, tell us about the survival and strategy of a species? Let's look at, at type 1, which is a human, okay? And basically, um, when you reach 50% of your lifespan, most humans are still alive. We don't start to die off until we reach the end of our lifespan. Now, what's that say about a type 3? Okay, what happens to a type 3 organism? I'll let you answer that question. And what about a type 2? What happens with a type 2 organism? Think about that and tell me uh, about what you see in this graph. Okay, so in one, we have type one, high death rate in, in the post-reproductive years. In two, we see constant mortality rate throughout their lifespan. And in a type three curve, we see very high early mortality but the few survivors then live relatively long lives and they stay, they continue to reproduce. And we have the oyster in a type three, produces lots of eggs in the beginning and then most of those uh, young die off. Can you think of some other species that might be a type three? Or maybe one that's a type two, okay, where we pretty much constant mortality. That one's probably a little tougher for you, okay? But uh, see if you can think about some. Google one if you have to, all right? So when we think of how fast a population grows, we have to, there are some other factors that affect population growth rate. Sex ratio is a big one. Okay, if you have a whole bunch of males and just very few females, your population is not going to grow very fast. If it's the other way around, it can grow a lot faster. Females are the limiting factor in this. Also, generation time. At what age do females reproduce? 
how many times do they reproduce during their lifetime? Okay, these are all factors that um, lead to uh, whether a population is growing quickly or slowly. Humans and elephants and great apes like gorillas and chimpanzees uh, all have very similar type 1 reproductive curves and we all start to reproduce at about the same age when we are teenagers. Okay, or have the capability to reproduce at least. Um, so uh, that's a very long time. Many other species things, things that think about, about a rabbit or a mouse or something like that, they can start reproducing the first year they are born and they can produce sometimes several litters of babies during that first year. If not the first year, definitely during the second year. Okay, and age structure. That's another one. How many females are at the reproductive age in a particular cohort. What's that word cohort mean? Cohort means a group of organisms that are within a certain age class. So in, when we look at human um, population pyramids, uh, we put those cohorts in blocks of five years. So zero to four would be one cohort, five to nine would be another cohort, 10 to 15 would be another cohort, and that's the population cohort that you are a member of right now, that 10 to 15 year old, you know, year old group, all the way on up until the uh, basically our, our lifespan ends.